Hello, Henry. This is Dimitris from Metal Cows from Chicago. How are you? Hi, man. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm doing fine. Well, we have something very uh, exciting to discuss. We have the new God Dethroned album. Indeed. But uh, <laughs> before doing so, I, I have to ask, um, The Judas Paradox is the first album released through Raining Phoenix Music. Yeah. After what? More than two decades with Metal Blade. Uh, how did you decide to make the switch? Uh, well, it was easy because um, we finished our third contract with Metal Blade mm -hmm. after 25 years. Uh, we had uh, three contracts, um, one for four albums, I believe, and then two contracts for three albums. So it was 10 in total. Uh, so we, we, uh, we finished it and then we thought, okay, we got a new offer from Metal Blade, but we thought it was really time to move somewhere else. To make a fresh start, you know. Um, when you've been on the same label for so long, at a certain point, uh, there's no uh, challenges anymore. There's nothing exciting anymore. Everybody is doing what they're doing best, and that's it. Sometimes you need a new label because people want to prove themselves. The label wants to prove themselves to us, and we want to prove ourselves to the label, which brings a new spark to the whole uh, situation. Everybody's enthusiastic, everybody's energetic, everybody wants to show their best. <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, like a win-win situation, I, I think. So I, I think it's a good idea to switch. I think after 25 years, it was about time. Uh, yeah, it, well, I say yeah, but uh, it can be tough to leave what you know and you have worked with, right? And But as you said, Changing sometimes works, and apparently it worked, right, with uh, the new album? <laughs> well, so far, the, the cooperation between us and the label is really good. Mm -hmm. um, you know, don't get me wrong. I'm not complaining about Metal Blade. Not no, at all. Yes. The, the day we owe them everything, but after 25 years, you have to move on. Or, you know, if you're one of the biggest bands on the label, then it's maybe better to stay, but, you know, we're not. So... It was a, it was a, a gamble, you know. You take a risk, and we took mm -hmm. the risk, and uh, I think it was uh, it was a good decision. Uh, had you started working on the album before making the switch, or this happened? Uh, you started working on the album after you signed with uh, Running Phoenix Music. Yeah, after um, we, I had done, I had written one song beforehand and I, we gave them that song as a sort of welcoming gift for signing us that we said here's asmodeus you can release it as a single and in the meantime we will work on the new album um it took more time than we expected uh we started later than we wanted uh but it was it was hard to find the right motivation to 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 write songs on a high level it was because Illuminati was released in February 2020, mm -hmm. a month before the pandemic broke out. Um, so we did a new album. We managed to do one tour, and then we the whole world came to a standstill. So we, I was sitting at home doing nothing. I, f I felt very demotivated, and it took me a long time to find my motivation back. Um, you know, if you do a new album... If we do a new album, afterwards I'm drained. I feel completely drained of energy because I put everything in it, you know. But usually the energy comes back because you play live, you get the response. That far. But I, we didn't do anything. So the energy was gone, but I didn't get it back. Correct. Um, so I felt I, it, it was difficult. But at a certain point, there was a song and everybody said, ah, that's the direction you want to go. And now we can contribute to the songwriting process as well. And then it went really quick. So we needed one more song just to get the whole the whole thing going. And then it was it was we had written the album in about three to four months or something. And honestly, that was last year. Honestly, the fans, uh we I didn't know uh how difficult it was for a band uh you know to stop touring. Uh, and then how difficult can it be to get back into business, quote unquote, right? Because I understand what you're talking about. You're giving so much energy. And then if you don't get something back, then it's 
almost like a half job done. Yeah, you know, everything needs to be in balance. So the energy you give, you need to get, get back at a certain point. Yes. Uh, if things are completely out of balance, it's not so easy. I mean, um, I, I don't know. Um, I didn't get any energy back. And, and then you, you have to, you want to write songs on a high level. You want to do things you haven't done before. So after every album, it, come, it becomes a little bit more difficult to come up with melodies and guitar riffs that you haven't played before. So we, we want to maintain that high level of, of songwriting. But yeah, it was harder this time because we gave so much for an album that's stranded somewhere in oblivion and then you have to do a new one. Yeah, that was a, a tough situation. Okay, let's talk about the actual album and uh, hopefully we will never go back discussing about such a uh, terrible period for everyone. Um, yeah. First of all, the cover artwork. How did you pick that painting? It's a painting. Uh, yeah, it's a painting. Yeah, it's, it's a painting. It's uh, it's in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's um, The painting is called uh, The Fall of the Rebel Angels. Um, yeah, it, it we chose it because, um, you know, I talked to our artwork guy and I said, I want I want some kind of biblical drawing, mm -hmm. uh, if possible, a pen drawing or whatever. And he said, well, I can't do it. <laughs> I'm not good enough to do a pen drawing, but I can look up something and we can do something with something else. You know, he, he's, he's always like that. So he came to me and said, what do you think of this painting? I said, well, if this is an existing painting, uh, can we use it? He said, yeah, sure. All you have to do, give credits to the painter, mention it in the CD booklet, and then you're fine. So that's what we did. And of course, we changed the colors. We made it monochromatic nice. um, to fit to fit the album. But uh, yeah, it's, it's an existing painting. But it's beautiful. So we didn't have to come up with something new because this was already there. Well, in my mind, as a metalhead, right? I was thinking, well, why do we have St. Michael defeating the rebels where we should be with the rebels right <laughs> you know it doesn't matter how you look at it yeah. um it's a painting that fits the concept and uh i i don't look at it in the way you do probably well I'm, I'm almost joking right so uh but you get what i'm saying right it's a black yeah. metal we win <laughs> yeah that, that's true very true but um yeah it's all good the way it is. Yes, absolutely. So how that, does this artwork fit the Judas Paradox concept? Because you have, you chose this song and this title for to focus on that lyrical subject that you have for that, for the song that opens the album. Yeah, yeah, very true. Um, yeah, you know, when, when we did all the songs, I just knew that this had to be the title track. Mm -hmm. When I got the idea... I, I thought about it for a long time already. What about the fact that maybe Judas was innocent? Nobody looks at that because everybody just accepts the fact that he's a betrayer. It's like uh, it's like one of these uh, cases uh, that you have in the US, but also in Europe. Somebody is convicted because everybody believes he is the perpetrator. And sometimes we don't even look at the evidence, you know, in real life it happens. So I thought about, I thought about what would happen if Judas was not, uh, was innocent. So that was a, like a, a fun thought to start with. And then I, when I write lyrics, I do research always. So the easiest thing is to look on the internet. What can I find on the internet? And then we'll see what, which direction it will go. So I looked on the internet. To my astonishment, I find out that there's two stories about Judas in the Bible. One story is the one where everybody knows Judas is the betrayer. The other story is uh, that Judas, oh sorry, Jesus could look into the future. So meaning he knew what was going to happen and he knew he had to be killed to, be, uh, to return as king of the world. So when he knows this and he knows he will choose Judas as uh, the, the guy who wants to, who has to fulfill this plan, that makes Judas innocent. And actually, there's many religions who see it like that. There's, uh, there's so many people who have different views on this. So I thought, okay, what if I uh, write a song about the topic that everybody knows, 
but I write it from Judas' point of view instead of the point of view of the world as we normally get it. So I wrote I wrote it like um, like that. So Judas is uh, explaining that he's one of the twelve disciples. He sees Jesus as his brother. He enjoys being a part of the group, basically. So then the song evolves a bit more towards the betrayal and the killing. And then when the clean singing starts, which is done by our guitar player, Dave, uh, then he speaks from G from Jesus to Judas and he explains, well, forgive me for what I did. I was uh, killed for a greater good and you were the chosen one. You were the one who had to do this. Which makes the story a complete opposite to what everybody is used to. Yeah, and but it's said, still based on the facts that are in the Bible. Yes, then there is, uh, as you said, there are religions that consider Judas as a saint because he basically did his own, he sacrificed himself for the greatest plan and the grand design. So, yeah. Yeah. And as you said, sometimes the act um, blinds people and we don't see anything else. We don't see the evidence. We need to see something happen to punish that person. So no matter what, in our minds, it's guilty, no matter what. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so how do you get the themes uh, that will you will uh, deal with uh, the lyrics um, before or after starting, or after the music is done? After. Um, I usually have a, a, a song title in mind. Um, or, or I have an image in mind, and I, 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 I invent, I come up with a title. If I have an image, you have, you should see it as a, as an image from a movie, and a movie needs a title. Or I have a title for a movie, and then I get an image in my head what that should fit to the title of the movie. And when I have that, then I also know what kind of music would fit to the movie. So then I start writing the music on guitar. And once I have the music finished, then I can do the lyrics. That's that's my way of working. So I work with a vision in my mind. I see something before me. It's a picture or it's a title. When it's a title, I, I come up with a picture and then I make music. Or when I have a picture, I come up with a title and then I make music. But it's always there's always a picture in my head that tells me this is a a song about this and this subject. This is a fast song or slow song or an atmospheric song or an aggressive song. It's all determined by the title and the picture that I have in my head. I don't know if it makes sense. Oh no, but that's how it works. It it's the way it's it's your uh, it's the way your mind works. Um, what I was getting that where is that you had three albums with Concert Bow War, then you switched to Illuminati. Is it easier to basically not have a specific concept? to talk about rather than different different subjects yes it's easier to have uh, the concept albums are very complicated mm. we did three albums about world war one because at that time nobody was doing albums about world war one i think we initiated it maybe some bands had one song about world war one but nobody had a whole album about yeah. world war one and then we decided to do three albums about it well, the, the first one was the easiest one because I could choose whatever topic I wanted about the war and it it was there for me to use. On the second album, it became a lot more difficult because I used all the, the great topics for album number one. On the third album, it became very, very difficult to, to, to keep writing about the same topic. So I was really happy that I, that I was finished. <laughs> so then... On Illuminati, we I had all the freedom again. I wanted to go back to the darker, darker lyrics, darker image. So writing about Illuminati, Freemasonry, conspiracy theories, stuff like that. And now on the new album, I we took that line and we took it further. Um, it's a lot of fun because every song is different. Every song has its own topic. It makes life a lot easier, I can tell you. <laughs> Especially after after you've done so many albums, because you don't want to repeat yourself. So it becomes harder and harder anyway. Yeah, but although I, I in my mind, writing music is more difficult than lyrics, but I'm not professional at all. <laughs> uh, well, maybe it's true, uh, but you want to have a good feeling about the things you write, whether it's the music or it's the lyrics. If you have the feeling you're making a complete fool out of yourself, then that's not a good feeling. 
I understand. Yeah. Um, you have the band has Frank as the newest member. So yeah. what does he bring to the sound of Godly Throne? And what did he bring uh, uh, to the sound of the new album? Well, he brings uh, his very own typical drumming style, which is a very punky, aggressive uh, way of playing. He's um, he's a laid back player. He's a bit like uh, like Dave Lombardo. Mm -hmm. So he's a laid back player. He's not rushing the music, but he is very aggressive in his style. So all his drum fills are really pointy, punky, uh, aggressive. But at the same time, when he when he plays the beats, it's laid back. So the band can play super tight. It's got a great feeling, and that's his signature to to play laid back, but to make it sound as aggressive as possible. It's really good. Yeah, uh, and in this album, there is, um, and this is something that God the Throne does, right? You have melody, but you have the aggression parts. So it's not a, um, let's say, a single directional music. You have so many things. Yeah, we like it like that because um, if, I think if an if an album is only aggressive and fast, it gets boring. And the same if an album is only slow and and and, and mid tempo and, and melodic, it's also boring. I like the I like to mix things up. So this album has like a few fast and aggressive songs, a few mid tempo mid tempo based melodic songs, and a few atmospheric songs. So when you start the album from beginning to end. Or when you listen to the album from beginning to end, you we will take you on a trip mm. through the highs and lows of the album, and 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 then when you heard the last song, it feels like the circle is round again. But of see, course, I'm of going. course, nowadays it's it's a bit difficult because people listen to playlists, mm -hmm. hear maybe one or two songs, or only know the singles. But you know, we make the album still for our fans who want to hear the album from beginning to end. Yeah, uh, you touch upon a subject that, I, I don't know, it feels like we have kind of changed the way we listen to music and it it it's, um, it does not do, does, it doesn't do justice to the, to the musicians because if you get an entire album and just pick two songs or one, oh my goodness, you're destroying the entire experience. Yeah, I, I agree. It's one of the things that I, I have difficulties with nowadays. Um, I think we should make a choice as a band or also also as a record label because the record label wants us to do an album, a full album, and then we put it out and people, uh, many people only listen one or two or three songs. I think it's a waste of energy. In that case, I would say, why don't we do a new single every two months? And not, not work on a whole album, but just do a single every two months. Because if that's what people want, then we could do it like that. If you put so much energy in writing 10 or or 11 songs, but people, most of the people only listen to two or three, then why do I write all the other songs? I think then it's better to just do a song every two months and only focus on one song every two months. I, I can definitely see that happening as a personal choice i wouldn't like that to happen because i still buy my records i still buy vinyls and you know in my mind i have uh, it's like chapters of a band yeah but again who, who am i i'm almost 50 now so it's not up to me as you said uh, everything has changed so i i, I don't know but i definitely see what you're saying uh releasing yeah, i mean i mean if if you know the, uh, with, uh, with people like you and me who still buy albums, records, uh, vinyl, uh, we buy the the old school things that we just like to have in our hand and to have in our collection in, in at home. That's beautiful. But if let's say in five five years from now nobody is buying CDs anymore and nobody is collecting anything and people are just streaming and only streaming, then what's the point of doing a whole album? I don't see it anymore then. In in that case, no. Yeah. I have nothing. <laughs> I hope it, it doesn't come to that point because uh, pff, then we miss the point of, you know, what is the early stuff? If you, if a band keeps releasing song songs, there is no there is no clear distinction in the timeline of a band. 
uh, there is not a period like we discussed. God the Throne wrote uh, um, three albums about the World War Through uh, one. Oh my goodness! Yeah. And then you switch subjects. How do we do that if we have singles? There is no continuity. Of, but anyways. Yeah, I know. I totally agree. <laughs> but what what could be a possibility is that you do uh, singles, and exactly. after after five or six singles, you say, okay, but we have four songs more, and we're going to put that on the album on a CD, and then we release the CD for the people to have it and in the meantime we've done the singles I don't know something like a middle way but if now now it's a lot of work and, it and, and it's only for the for the real fans and the people who, who just listen to playlists they hear one song yeah oof okay <laughs> uh, you did two <laughs> music videos I'm changing subject two music videos for Rat Kingdom and uh, the Judas Paradox um oh. Did you have any input on the concept of uh, those videos? Oh yes, definitely. Um, I, you know, the, the guy who did the videos for us, him and I, we uh, we talked about uh, what it should look like, where we should film it. So the film, the 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 video for Red Kingdom was filmed in uh, in Roman catacombs. Actually, they were rebuilt in our country. Wow. It's like it's like a museum who rebuilt uh, Roman catacombs, and we were lucky enough to to be able to film there. So that was beautiful because the song is about the catacombs of the Vatican, right? So it it couldn't be better than that. And for the second single for um, the Judas Paradox, we went to an abandoned factory with a beautiful background to film the Last Supper. So we were really lucky to get the, the, the right places, the right environments to do the videos. And yeah, we, I, 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 we made the plans, the, the filmmaker and me. We talked about what it should look like, how we should film it, and that's what we did. So it was something worthwhile to do, you know, because we could do our own ideas. The record company was like, do what you want, it's fine. And they were very happy with it. Yeah, and the only they, thing that they decided was which songs should be the singles. Okay, <laughs> for that kingdom, I would love to hear the discussion. How you ask for permission to shoot down there? Well, we have a band called Godi Throne. Can we have <laughs> access to the catacombs film <laughs> video? Yeah. You know what happened? They didn't ask for the band name. Perfect. <laughs> and I, I was so sure that if they find out, they would not. They would refuse to have us there. I'm sure. But they didn't ask, so... <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, for that specific uh, song, Red Kingdom, you, the solo is kind of special, right? Yeah, you wrote it in the style of Jeff. How do yeah, you... I, I always do that. Um, I think since day one, since day one that I play in a band, I mean, uh, I started playing in a band when I was 17, and the first guitar solo that came out was a, a Slayer-like guitar solo. I've, I grew up with uh, guitar solos like that. Of course, I also grew up with the guitar solos of Chuck Children or uh, Dave Mustaine, uh, you know, people like that. So I, I grew up with the, the really technical guitar players, but also with the guys of Slayer. I already knew pretty quickly that I was not able to play guitar solos like Dave Mustaine or Marty Friedman or whatever. It's just not, it's just not in me. But I, I could play guitar solos in the vein of Jeff Hanneman and Kerry King. And, and my style is more towards Jeff Hanneman than Kerry King. So basically, I've done that since my 17th. I've played guitar solos like that. And uh, I just, just pointed it out this time. You know, normally I don't really speak about it. People can just listen. And now I was writing the, the press release for, um, for the song. And I thought like, yeah, this is my this is my tribute to Jeff, and I I just mentioned it for once, you know. Normally I don't speak about it, but this time I said, yeah, this is my tribute to Jeff, and that's what it is. And yeah. I think it's a beautiful tribute. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, before um, I have one more question, but before going to that, I was struggling because I'm not an English speaker native. I'm Greek, so I was trying to understand what hubris anorexia is about. Can you help me a little bit? <laughs> Yes, um, yes. Well, I, I, I completely understand that nobody understands what the title means because hubris is like, is like a, 
it's like courage, but in in it's more than just courage. And anorexia is a very bad thing. It's uh, getting well if you don't eat, you get that, you know. So hubris anorexia is two contradictions put together. It's like a bold, the bold guy with the with a lot of courage goes anorexia. I know it's a bit weird, but um, the song is in fact about the experience that everybody, a lot of people had during the pandemic, mm. where you would be in your in your home. You was you were supposed to stay at home and not leave your house unless you were vaccinated. Especially here in the, in the Netherlands, you could not go to a supermarket if you were not vaccinated. You could not go to public places. People would look at you as if you were crazy in the head if you would not be vaccinated. The people who had questions about how safe the vaccinations were, they were called crazy. They were put aside like the witches in the Middle Ages, like they were not put on the, on, on the, on the stake. But it was not far away from that, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. So the song is about uh, being in confinement, being in, almost imprisoned, and you can get free if you take a vaccination or an injection. Hmm. And that's what the song is about. Uh, but but many people got very ill because of the vaccinations, and I was one of them. And so this song is my protest song to having to accept something that I didn't want but I felt I was forced to take it because it was the only way for me to go, to leave my house, to play a show every once in a while. And um, only to find out later that the stuff is not safe and that you can get very ill. And some people even died because of the vaccinations. Yeah. That, so this is where the hubris, hubris part comes. I, I, I see what you're saying. Yeah. 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 Uh, okay. Uh, September 26th, you start the tour with Batushka. Yeah. Um, what is how the rest of the year looks for uh, God dethroned? Well, the, the tour will last for uh, for a month until the end of October. So then it's only two months and then the year is over. Mm -hmm. uh, the plan now is to come to the U.S. Uh, somewhere um, in March for a tour for, I don't know, five, six weeks. Um, so that's the plan for early 2025. And then... Uh, I hope that we can also go to Latin America again, Southeast Asia, Australia, New Zealand. I really want to do a, a world tour again with a new album, like we did in the past, but with our albums to, to do a world tour. Um, and we'll see if it happens. I will, I will see if it works out. But uh, that's the goal, to do uh, multiple tours in Europe, the US, and Latin America, and uh Asia and Oceania uh, later later next year. So for that's March, the plan. Uh, that you said US uh, is this? Will this be a headlining tour? No, no, no. We haven't been in the US for a long time, mm -hmm. uh, so we're not in a position to do a headlining tour. Okay. Um, we we. Uh, we've been away too long to take that risk. We need to come with the bands with more name or with a package with a strong with some strong names in it uh, to be able to play for a decent amount of people. Okay. If we would take the gamble and, and try to headline in the US, it would probably be a disappointment. Yeah, especially again, after the pandemic, things have changed, right? Uh, we had a two year gap. Uh, the funds changed, uh, the economics have changed. Now it's very, very, it has become very, very expensive yeah. to come to the US, let alone tour. Uh, so I, I definitely understand what you're talking about. So hopefully this tour will go great and we will see God the Throne again uh, in, during the fall in 2025. Yeah, I hope so. I really hope so, yes. Okay. Henry, thank you very much for your time. Uh, have safe travels. Great shows and see you in March here in Chicago. Keep that in mind. Yeah, I will keep it in mind, man. Thank you for the interview. Absolutely. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.